Uh, I'm Adam and I garden here in West Wales. This is my little patch of paradise. This is where my life is. This is, in a way, gardening is my life. It's, it's what I do every day. Um, and I've always gardened. I and mean, I haven't actually uh, chose gardening as a hobby. Gardening found me from a very young age. And it's because I was brought up in a family that's kind of always gardened from generation to generation. It's never really been something we've thought about. It's more something we just do because it's a way of life. It's, it's my hobby, it's my delight, it's my lifestyle, it's, it's everything I do. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and sometimes people always say that you should, you know, have an escape from, from, from the world. Well, when your world's gardening, you don't need an escape because that is the escape. And I've never felt the need to escape because gardening's always been a part of me and hopefully it always will be. Well, when I moved to this property about five years ago now, I think, um, this garden was completely unusable wild. Um, we had every invasive weed species you could think of. And it, it, it would, you know, it was, to me, it was a big space. It's, it's, it's about um, just over a third of an acre to half an acre. So it's, it's a large garden in terms of um, what, what you generally would have of a household. But it's, again, it's a manageable size um, to be able to live a self-sufficient life. And it was always, um, an ambition to create a garden that sustains us as a family. There's two of us in the house at the moment, but we really um, like to find a way in a way that we can produce our own food in a way that is self-sufficient, is sustainable, is friendly to the environment. Because I do garden in a way that um, encourages nature into the garden. I, I, do, I feel strongly that um, it's not just my garden, although it's my kingdom, it's where I live, it's where I, I uh, it's where I grow my, my produce. It actually was a garden to wildlife before I was here. Um, so for me, it's, it's paramount that I bring the wildlife into the garden. So I grow flowers in the garden, um, primarily because it's beneficial to attract pollinators into the garden, which then gets, creates greater yields uh, with my vegetables. And I also like the fact that it makes it uh, prettier. It beautifies the garden. Veg garden doesn't need to be something that's, you know, industrial, it can be beautiful as well. Before I moved here, I garden in a very traditional way because like I said, you know, gardening has always been um, something that's part of me. And I've been taught through experience from my uh, family members who've just gardened over generations. And when, when I, when I uh, had my own garden, I, I could reverse all that and think, well, what's the best way of growing things in the space that I've got? And um, and I learnt, you know, some of the principles around surrounding permaculture and not disrupting structures that are already in the garden, the soil structure. So following the no dig method is something we, we've done since the outset from establishing this garden and raised beds as well in terms of being able to, you know, not manipulate the such, but control the soil conditions because in West Wales, we're, in, we're renowned for a lot of wet weather and rain. And where I live is God's Lass, and God's Lass translates into English as the green bog. So the, the land around this garden is marshy grassland, roast pasture. So when it rains, it doesn't only rain, but it creates rivers within seconds. So um, one of the things we had to do from the outset to protect our crops was to create a raised bed garden so just you know six inches um, to nine inches off the ground is just enough then for that water to wash away rather than battling against the elements in the garden you need to garden to the environment that you live in and you've always got to alter the way you garden based upon the ground conditions and um, so we, it's a very wet space but actually we use that to our advantage because obviously growth is not a problem we don't suffer much from drought in this bed here, I'm growing uh, Russian kale, but as you can see, I'm mulching it with a layer of wool fleece. Now, this is a byproduct from packaging that's used to insulate, and the reason I'm doing it is because it's a weed suppressant, obviously because the light can't um, reach the soil to germinate the weed seeds, but it retains moisture because um, you get less evaporation during the sun's heat, but it also is a great slug and snail uh, deterrent because the fibres in the wool themselves um, slugs don't tend to like to travel over it. I'm not saying it's going to completely eliminate the amount of slugs that reach the plants, but it's definitely, as you can see from this kale here, quite young luscious leaves ordinarily would be eaten by slugs 
but I've got no problems here whatsoever. We're right by the field, by a um, wildlife head, which is an absolutely fantastic area for slugs to live and breed in the night time. But yet again, there's no damage, not even on the edges near the long grass, because the wool is um, suppressing the population of the slugs actually coming onto the bed to eat the kale. When it comes to techniques, gardening techniques, you couldn't crop rotate in this garden, for example. Crop rotation wouldn't work. And I'm veering away from the idea that you need to um, follow principles of crop rotation because I've planted similar plants in the same areas in the past five years. Um, and, you know, following those principles, you'd, you'd, you'd expect probably a greater incidence of um, disease, but I'm not seeing that at all. Um, and when, when you've got a confined, I say confined space, it's a large garden, but when you've got confined conditions to garden in, crop con um, rotation doesn't be, it's not viable. Um, so for us, for example, because we do have shade in the garden, I've got to grow currants or rhubarb or um, shade-loving plants in those areas continuously. I can't um, alternate my salad beds because that's where they grow best. Um, and, you know, I, I, even though it's a large garden, I grow a lot of my veg in containers as well. So potatoes, for example, carrots, they're always grown in containers in 30 litre buckets. When it comes to growing potatoes, growing sap or mira is one of the best varieties I've found in the garden because you can grow them throughout the year. Um, now, for example, here I've got some young sap or miras that I planted a fortnight ago after harvesting some new potatoes, um, yet these will be ready to harvest any time from late September onwards. Um, and the beauty of them is that they're blight resistant. So I've got these are planted traditionally, you know, when you plant your main crop of potatoes, um, early April, end of March, and um, so these will be ready to harvest any time from August onwards. But the beauty of them is because they're blight resistant, you don't have to um, worry about rushing to get them out of the soil. You can leave these in these buckets or in the soil if you're growing them in, in, in the ground throughout the winter. And um, they, don't, they don't damage at all from blight. Obviously, if it's a wetter than average winter, you may suffer a bit of rot or slug damage in, in the soil, but essentially, there are crop of potatoes that store so well in, in, in the ground. And with the buckets, what I will do, I'll cut away the foliage here and I'll just pop it in the corner of the shed then in a dry space and I leave it. And then when I want my potatoes, I'll just go in and harvest them. Um, and it's as simple as that. There's no stress to it. It's easy. The potatoes are tasty and you have a large, um, prolific crop for such a small area of space. You, you know, I'll have easily three or four um, feeds of potatoes from one bucket like this. So that's three or four weeks worth of Sunday lunch, when you think of it like that, you know? And that's, that for me, when you work out the calendar of the winter, 16, 16 weeks, four months maybe, you've got loads of um, crops then to help you through the winter. I've, I've never actually been someone who gets um, disappointed that something hasn't grown. I just think, well, why hasn't it grown? And I find that a new challenge and I, I get excited then about trying to combat that challenge. Um, and Yes, I've got the luxury of many beds where I can experiment, but even if you've only got one bed, maybe the northern side of that bed to the southern side of that bed varies greatly in terms of wind exposure, in terms of the condition of the soil, in terms of how the sun turns around. You may have eight hours of sunlight at the bottom end of the bed, so you can grow most vegetables easily, and only six and a half at this top corner. But that actually allows you then to plan that bed in that way. So get to know your garden, get, get to feel the essence of it and adapt it over time. Trees grow. Trees will change the shade in the garden over two years. So maybe where I'm having eight hours of sunlight now will only be six hours in two years time. So then I'll have to adapt the garden again. But that's the best bit about gardening. It's just, it's just um, a continuous experiment of chopping and changing and having fun. Naturally, part of being self-sufficient is producing food in many different ways. And one of the ways that we produce our own food here is by um, breeding poultry and using poultry around the garden. I've got quails, I've got um, hens, and I've also got ducks, and they've all got very different um, uses in the garden. One of the best things about quail bedding, especially if you use pine needles, which is what I use as a bedding material, is that it's um, naturally acidic when it breaks down, so it makes a fantastic mulch for um, around the blueberries. And although um, there's conflicting evidence in terms of when you should use it in the garden, I must admit I use it straight away on the soil. So I put um, a mulch down here, about two inches of mulch of quail bedding, as you can see here. Um, in the beginning of March, this is fresh bedding, and the blueberry uh, crop is fantastic 
uh, the yields are heavy every year from doing this and i think it's because there's a combination of the nitrogen within the bed in the manure itself but also the acidity of the um, pine needles as they um, break down and and compost ducks are absolutely um the, the quack pack i call them they're just robots they're machines when it comes to slug and snail control um, they, they, they seem to find a way to meander around the beds in this garden without harming the, the, the lettuce, without eating the brassicas. Although they love brassica leaves, their ultimate goal is to hunt out the slugs, to forage for those little creatures that can sometimes create problems in the garden. But slug control, yeah, we're completely organic. We don't use any, um, any kinds of uh, chemicals to prevent slugs. My ducks have... They're Welsh Harlequin breed, they're a native Welsh breed, the only uh, Welsh breed of ducks there is, um, originating from Khaki Campbells. They're very docile, they're very tame, they're not flighty, you can, you know, they're manageable. Um, you, don't, you don't necessarily have to have a large space to have three or four ducks, and three or four ducks in a garden of this size is absolutely fantastic to help you control slugs. You know, they're my gardeners, I'm not the only gardener in this garden, the quack pack are my gardeners as well. Poultry, to me, is um, a key element in vegetable gardening especially and no dig gardening because if you want to mulch the soil every year they're the biggest producers of compost i know um you put weeds the weeds never make the compost heap in our garden they, they make the chicken pen because the chickens will eat that they'll compost it they'll trod it into the ground and then annually i'll go into the chicken pen with a few wheelbarrows and i'll have tons of well rotted manure and soil uh, that's a great soil conditioner and a melted chuck state onto the garden. So why waste time turning compost heaps when you can have the chickens do that for you and have fresh eggs for it at the same time? Um, so yeah, so um, if you've got the space, I definitely um, encourage anyone not to be afraid to make, take that leap and, and to house some poultry in the garden. Um, small spaces, quails, larger spaces, hens and ducks. The biggest influence in my life when it comes to gardening is was my grandfather. Um, I was brought up in a council house by, in, in, a, in a small village in West Wales um, where we didn't have much space. We had, uh, you know, maybe seven metres by ten metre courtyard type garden. And, but we produced a ton of edge in that small space. And my grandfather has been a massive influence on my life, um, especially when it comes to gardening. I lived with my grandfather after my grandmother passed away. And I think, you know, during that time, my gardening delight really intensified. Gardening for me is an international language. Now, my first language is Welsh. Um, I use Welsh in my day-to-day -day life and I've always um, known gardening through the medium of Welsh. However, uh, I have a keen uh, interest in languages and learning languages. So one of the things that I do is I um, use social media to promote Welsh, but through the medium of gardening. For example, at the moment, I have 7,000 followers on Instagram, um, and but I only use Welsh uh, as the language of the post on Instagram. Now, now, I use hashtags in many languages as a medium of pulling traffic to the post. The beauty of Instagram is that it's got a translation facility, so it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you can link into that message, and sometimes the translation can be questionable, but you can, um, like for example, I follow a lot of um, Spanish, French, Italian accounts. I speak German and Dutch, so I can, I can link into those accounts, um, and I'd love it if you um, could find an opportunity just to pop over and say hello.